Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Novak. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, I report on a new video game popular with cat lovers. Faith Perlow answers a question from a listener about the difference between the words mine and quarry. And we finish with the story by Nathaniel Hawthorne called The Ambitious Guest. But first, here is Jill Robbins. On a recent afternoon, vehicles moved up and down the dry riverbed of the Rio Grande River near Albuquerque, New Mexico. The drivers had a purpose. They were biologists hoping to save as many endangered fish as they could before the sun dried out shrinking puddles of water. For the first time in 40 years, the river that forms the border of Texas and Mexico went dry in Albuquerque last month. And the endangered Rio Grande silvery minnow is disappearing along with the water. Summer storms have brought river waters back, but experts warn that drying this far north is a sign of an increasingly limited water supply. They say that there might not be enough water to save the minnow and to provide water to nearby farms and communities. The minnow, a tiny native fish, lives in a small area of the 3,000-kilometer-long river. It has survived 100 years of habitat loss, as the water was moved, redirected, and taken from Colorado to New Mexico, Texas, and northern Mexico. In 1994, the U.S. government listed the Rio Grande silvery minnow as endangered. Scientists, local officials, and environmental groups have worked to keep the fish alive, as required by the Endangered Species Act. But their efforts have not been enough. Years of drought, high temperatures, and an unpredictable rain are destroying what remains of its habitat. Officials can do little. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologist Thomas Archdeacon leads a program to rescue the minnow. He said, When you have flow one day and no flow the next for miles, the fish don't know how to get out of that. When parts of the river dry out, officials use small nets to pull fish from worn puddles and move them to still-flowing parts of the river. The minnow's survival rate after being rescued is poor. Only 5% survive the experience. Still, leaving them in the puddles is a certain death sentence, Archdeacon said. Over the years, the government has bred and released large numbers of silvery minnows. But the fish need more water in the river to survive, officials say. Historically, one way to raise water levels has been to release it from man-made lakes. But this year, New Mexico has been unable to store extra water. The state must send water to Texas as part of an agreement. And the rainstorms in June were not enough to refill the river. To keep more water in the Rio Grande, the state is offering to pay farmers to leave fields unplanted. But few have agreed. In one area, officials said only 5% was left unplanted this year. We need more people to do it, said Jason Kosuga, chief engineer for the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District. But the program is just in its second year, and farmers want to grow crops, Kasuga said. For the past four years, Ron Moya has farmed about 20 hectares of land near Albuquerque. A retired engineer, Moya said he now works on the same land 
that generations of his family had farmed before him. Last year, Moya left four hectares unplanted in exchange for several thousand dollars. But he said he would not do it this year, although he was offered more money. That is because he wanted the moisture to keep the soil on his farm alive. New Mexico's biggest city, Albuquerque, is also not likely to give up water. Like other western U.S. areas, the city of 563,000 has greatly limited water usage, from about 946 liters a day in 1994 to 450 liters in 2019. I'm Jill Robbins. A new video game that includes a brave cat is popular with cat lovers. Some of them are using the game to raise money for real cats. The game was released last month. It is called Stray. A stray animal is one without a home. Many stray cats and dogs live on city streets. Thanks to online fundraising services, gamers are playing Stray live for audiences to raise money for animal shelters and other cat-connected organizations. Annapurna Interactive, the game's creator, publicized Stray by offering two cat rescue and adoption agencies copies of the game to give away. Live-streaming gameplay for charity is not new but the quick popularity of Stray is a bit unusual. It was the fourth most watched game on the day it was first shown on Twitch, the video game streaming site. Viewers watch as players send the game's cat through a city to solve problems and escape enemies. The cat in the game does all this while doing usual cat activities, like scratching, jumping, or hitting things off tables. About 80% of the game's creative team are cat owners and cat lovers, the game's producers said. I certainly hope that maybe some people will be inspired to help actual strays in real life, said Swan Martin Raget. He is a game producer of Stray, and works at the Blue 12 Gaming Studio in France. Annapurna Interactive contacted the Nebraska Humane Society to discuss a partnership before the game's launch on July 19th. The Humane Society jumped at the chance, marketing specialist Brendan Gibson said. The whole game and the whole culture around the game It's all about a love of cats, Gepson said. It meshed really well with the shelter and our mission. The shelter received four copies of the game to give away. People donated $5 for a chance to win one of the games. In one week, the shelter raised $7,000, Gepson said. Most of the 550 donors were new to the shelter, including people from Germany and Malta. Jeff Legaspi is Annapurna Interactive's marketing director. He said it made sense for the game's launch to do something impactful or making a powerful influence. He added that he hopes the game will bring more awareness to adopting and not shopping for a new pet. The game is available on PlayStation and the Steam online game platform. Steam monitor SteamDB said Stray has been the number one purchased game for the past two weeks. Hello. This week on Ask a Teacher, we will answer a question from Yusuf about the difference between mine and quarry. Hi, VOA learning team. Would you please help me to understand the difference between quarry and mine? Thanks, Yusuf. Dear Yusuf, this is a great question. Thank you for asking it. Both mine and quarry 
can be used as nouns and verbs. Their meanings are related, but are different in important ways. Let us start with the word mine. As a noun, a mine is a hole dug underground to recover minerals and other valuable substances from the earth. For example, recently a large pink diamond was found in a mine in the African country of Angola. Mine as a noun has another meaning. A mine is a bomb that is hidden underground as a defensive weapon. These landmines cause many deaths, even long after a war is over. Large pouch rats in Africa are trained to find landmines by using their sense of smell. A floating mine can also be put in the sea as a weapon against ships. A mine can also be any large supply of a resource. For example, there is a mine of information on the internet. Mine can also be a verb. To mine means to dig useful or valuable substances out of the earth. Americans went west to California in the mid 1800s to mine for gold. This is called the California Gold Rush. A quarry, like a mine, is a place where valuable minerals or rocks are recovered, but it is open on the Earth's surface rather than underground. Rocks, sand, and minerals are removed from quarries. Big pieces of stone, like limestone and granite, and some minerals are removed from quarries as building materials. The ancient Egyptians cut huge blocks of limestone and granite from quarries to build the Great Pyramids. The noun quarry has another meaning. It can be an animal or even a person that is hunted. The dogs chased their quarry through the field. Quarry, as a verb, can mean to take or dig from. There are many sites in the United States where you can quarry for fossils. The use of quarry and mine is sometimes linked to the kind of mineral being recovered, so limestone is almost always quarried, while diamonds are usually mined. So, a mine is a hole underground that is used to remove minerals and valuable substances from the earth. A quarry is like a mine, but is on the surface of the earth, and usually is used to remove large pieces of stone, sand, or minerals. It can also be something that is hunted or sought after. Both quarry and mine, as verbs, mean to dig something out of the earth. Please let us know if these examples and explanations have helped you, Yusuf. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Faith Perlow. Our story today is called The Ambitious Guest. It was written by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Here is Harry Monroe with our story. One December night, a long, long time ago, a family sat around the fireplace in their home. A golden light from the fire filled the room. 
The mother and father laughed at something their oldest daughter had just said. The girl was seventeen, much older than her little brother and sister, who were only five and six years old. A very old woman, the family's grandmother, sat knitting in the warmest corner of the room. And a baby, the youngest child, smiled at the fire's light from its tiny bed. This family had found happiness in the worst place in all of New England. They had built their home high up in the White Mountains, where the wind blows violently all year long. The family lived in an especially cold and dangerous spot. Stones from the top of the mountain above their house would often roll down the mountainside and wake them in the middle of the night. No other family lived near them on the mountain. But this family was never lonely. They enjoyed each other's company and often had visitors. Their house was built near an important road that connected the White Mountains to the St. Lawrence River. People traveling through the mountains in wagons always stopped at the family's door for a drink of water and a friendly word. Lonely travelers crossing the mountains on foot would step into the house to share a hot meal. Sometimes the wind became so wild and cold that these strangers would spend the night with the family. The family offered every traveler who stopped at their home a kindness that money could not buy. On that December evening, the wind came rushing down the mountain. It seemed to stop at their house to knock at the door before it roared down into the valley. The family fell silent for a moment, but then they realized that someone really was knocking at their door. The oldest girl opened the door and found a young man standing in the dark. The old grandmother put a chair near the fireplace for him. The oldest daughter gave him a warm, shy smile, and the baby held up its little arms to him. This fire is just what I needed, the young man said. The wind has been blowing in my face for the last two hours. The father took the young man's travel bag. Are you going to Vermont? the older man asked. Yes, to Burlington, the traveler replied. I wanted to reach the valley tonight. But when I saw the light in your window, I decided to stop. I would like to sit and enjoy your fire and your company for a while. As the young man took his place by the fire, something like heavy footsteps was heard outside. It sounded as if someone was running down the side of the mountain taking enormous steps. The father looked out one of the windows. That old mountain has thrown another stone at us again. He must have been afraid we would forget him. He sometimes shakes his head and makes us think he will come down on top of us, the father explained to the young man. But we are old neighbors, he smiled, and we manage to get along together pretty well. 
Besides, I have made a safe hiding place outside to protect us in case a slide brings the mountain down on our heads. As the father spoke, the mother prepared a hot meal for their guest. While he ate, he talked freely to the family, as if it were his own. This young man did not trust people easily. Yet on this evening, something made him share his deepest secret with these simple mountain people. The young man's secret was that he was ambitious. He did not know what he wanted to do with his life yet, but he did know that he did not want to be forgotten after he had died. He believed that sometime during his life he would become famous and be admired by thousands of people. So far, the young man said, I have done nothing. If I disappeared tomorrow from the face of the earth, no one would know anything about me. No one would ask, Who was he? Where did he go? But I cannot die until I have reached my destiny. Then let death come. I will have built my monument. The young man's powerful emotions touched the family. They smiled. You laugh at me, the young man said, taking the oldest daughter's hand. You think my ambition is silly. She was very shy, and her face became pink with embarrassment. It is better to sit here by the fire, she whispered, and be happy even if nobody thinks of us. Her father stared into the fire. I think there is something natural in what the young man says, and his words have made me think about our lives here. It would have been nice if we had had a little farm down in the valley, some place where we could see our mountains without being afraid they would fall on our heads. I would have been respected by all our neighbors, and when I had grown old, I would die happy in my bed. You would put a stone over my grave so everyone would know I lived an honest life. You see, the young man cried out, it is in our nature to want a monument. Some want only a stone on their grave. Others want to be a part of everyone's memory. But we all want to be remembered after we die. The young man threw some more wood on the fire to chase away the darkness. The firelight fell on the little group around the fireplace. The father's strong arms and the mother's gentle smile. It touched the young man's proud face and the daughter's shy one. It warmed the old grandmother, still knitting in the corner. She looked up from her knitting, and with her fingers still moving the needles, she said, Old people have their secrets, just as young people do. The old woman said she had made her funeral clothes some years earlier. They were the finest clothes she had made since her wedding dress. She said her secret was a fear that she would not be buried in her best clothes. 
The young man stared into the fire. Old and young, he said, we dream of graves and monuments. I wonder how sailors feel when their ship is sinking and they know they will be buried in the wide and nameless grave that is the ocean. A sound rising like the roar of the ocean shook the house. Young and old exchanged one wild look. Then the same words burst from all their lips. The slide, the slide. They rushed away from the house into the darkness to the secret spot the father had built to protect them from the mountain slide. The whole side of the mountain came rushing toward the house like a waterfall of destruction. But just before it reached the little house, the wave of earth divided in two and went around the family's home. Everyone and everything in the path of the terrible slide was destroyed, except the little house. The next morning, smoke was seen coming from the chimney of the house on the mountain. Inside, the fire was still burning. The chairs were still drawn up in a half circle around the fireplace. It looked as if the family had just gone out for a walk. Some people thought that a stranger had been with the family on that terrible night, but no one ever discovered who the stranger was. His name and way of life remain a mystery. His body was never found. You have just heard the story, The Ambitious Guest. It was written by Nathaniel Hawthorne and adapted for special English by Dona DeSanctis. Your narrator was Harry Monroe. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Dan Novak.